Go ahead. Hello, um, my name is Cassandra Taylor and I am the founder and CEO of Top Flight Defense Incorporated. And this month of May is known for the National Stroke Awareness Month. And I have asked one of my colleagues, we don't work together, but we work at the same facility, um, Dr. Laurel J. Cherian to come in and speak with us on stroke awareness and the risk factors of having a stroke. So Laura, can you give us a little background about yourself and start on to your presentation? Absolutely, thank you so much for having me. So I'm a vascular neurologist by training um, here at Rush University Medical Center. Um, so I spend most of my time uh, taking care of people who are having strokes in the hospital and um, meeting them down in the emergency room. We have a large telestroke network, which allows us to uh, see people with our stroke robots that are out in uh, emergency departments um, further out and we can helicopter, in, helicopter them into um, rush for treatment if needed, if they're having a large stroke. Uh, and then I also split my time between um, the medical college. So I'm one of the assistant deans in the medical college and get to train our medical students, which is um, a wonderful opportunity. And um, I'm also on several NIH funded um, grants and my particular interest in research, which I'll talk about a bit um, in the next hour is the role of nutrition on stroke outcomes. In particular, the role of um, nutrition on cognition and mental health outcomes after having a stroke. So after a stroke, uh, your risk of developing dementia doubles and uh, roughly a third to a half of all people after having a stroke suffer with uh, depression. And so those are really common things that you think of having a stroke and you're working on rehab and getting your strength back, but there are a lot of other outcomes um, with stroke as well. And so looking at the role that nutrition has in eating the right foods and how that can support brain health uh, is really what I dedicate a lot of my time to when I'm not actually taking care of patients. So this is a great um, opportunity for me because I get to talk about uh, several of the things that I'm passionate about, and I hope um, you all get something out of this and uh, can pass that information along to your friends and family as well. So um, we'll go ahead and get started here. And I'm just gonna start out with the signs and symptoms of stroke because um, we say time is brain. So when these symptoms start, the sooner you get into a hospital and get care, the more likely you are to go back to normal or minimize the amount of damage that's done. So the mistakes that I see people make occasionally, especially if it's a mild stroke where maybe they've got just some tingling or a little bit of mild weakness, it doesn't hurt the way a heart attack hurts. And so people aren't in agony and they sometimes will think, well, that's weird. I'm gonna go take a nap and sleep this off, which is the exact wrong thing to do. That may be your window to actually do something about it and fix it before it's too late. Um, so this, this picture here is from the American Heart Association, and we say we use this acronym FAST, F-A-S-T. And these are not all the symptoms of a stroke, but these are the major ones. Most people with stroke are going to have one of these things. So um, facial drooping. So if the face is kind of drooping off to the side, maybe drooling out of the corner of the mouth, uh, and you're having trouble talking, slurring your words, um, that would be one. Uh, arm weakness. So you put your arms out in front of you, and one of them is kind of drifting down. Um, and drooping or you're dropping things out of your hand, that, that strength or motor weakness can be a symptom of a stroke. And it's usually on one side and not the other. Um, and then finally, speech difficulty. So you're, you've got the words, you know what you wanna say and they're just not coming out. Uh, or you can't understand what other people are saying to you. There's a sort of communication difficulty where you're not able to express yourself or understand what other people are saying. Any of those three things, face, arm, speech, it's time to call 911. And the reason that it's good to actually call 911 as opposed to trying to drive yourself to the hospital or call your primary care doctor and see what their clinic says or go into some minute clinic or you know some other um, convenient um, you know walk-in location is that when you call 911, they immediately will look at those signs and symptoms of stroke and they will triage or direct you to the emergency department that is going to be the most likely to rapidly. The medications and the treatments that they give for stroke um, are not always available everywhere. And so that's why it's important that you call 911 because they'll get you where you need to go and they'll often let you jump the line. So if you just walked into the ER, hopefully the, the nurse and the triage would realize it's a stroke and, and kind of um, uh, get you to the front of the line. But when you come in via 911, 
they're already going to flag this as something that's super important, super time sensitive and critical. And oftentimes it'll um, get everything ready even before that ambulance comes into the hospital. So it's a, it's a great way to expedite things. And again, to really make sure that things are moving quickly and that we're um, saving time because time is brain. So here are the two different types of stroke. Um, the stroke is sort of this big umbrella term and it can mean a lot of different things. Um, and so when we kind of delineate underneath that, there are two broad categories of stroke and you may have heard of these or be aware of them. So on the left side of the picture here is hemorrhagic stroke. And that's where you have neurologic deficits these come on quickly that are due to a bleeding cause. So hemorrhage or bleeding out of the vessel and into the brain tissue. The other side, the other kind of stroke is what's called an ischemic stroke. And this is where you have a blockage of a blood vessel. And the, the brain tissue that is downstream from where that blockage is gets starved for oxygen and nutrients and starts to die off. And so the end result may be the same. Your arm goes weak, uh, you start slurring your words, you can't talk, but the cause of it can be different. It can be either from um, bleeding out of a vessel or a clot and a blockage of a vessel. Now, the causes of an ischemic stroke or a blockage kind of stroke, uh, they can come from the heart. Sometimes a blood clot can form in the heart and then fly up to the brain. Um, it can be due to cholesterol buildup or plaque, usually in the big arteries in the neck or in the head. And you can get um, so much plaque built up that it actually narrows the vessel down and not enough blood can get through or completely clots it off. Um, we say small vessel disease, and these are the little kind of fine, if you think of a tree, there's the trunk, right? And then it keeps going out and out and eventually get to these little wispy, smaller um, vessels. And those are very sensitive to blood pressure changes, blood sugar, uh, people with diabetes oftentimes will have damage to these small little delicate vessels and you can get a stroke related to that. And then there's other medical conditions that can put you at higher risk for stroke uh, as well as trauma or tears to the inside lining of the vessel. Um, there are some people that have genetic uh, mutations that make them more prone to clotting and they can have strokes related to that. Uh, and then sometimes we do a big workup and we don't necessarily find a smoking gun, um, but there was just for some reason they formed a clot or maybe they went into an arrhythmia with their heart long enough to form a clot and then they went back into a normal um, heart rate. And so we get this category sometimes where all the big tests that we do in the hospital may be normal and we may end up having to send them out with a heart monitor long term um, or something like that. The second big type of stroke, um, like I mentioned before, are hemorrhagic strokes or bleeding into the brain. And the most common cause of this by far is hypertension or high blood pressure. So you get this kind of pressure that's there for years and years and eventually those blood vessels are going to get damaged and more fragile and they're prone to actually blowing and having bleeding um, into the brain. So we'll talk a little bit more about hypertension when I get to the um, stroke risk factors. Uh, the next one on the list here is called cerebral amyloid angiopathy, and that's a mouthful, but what it essentially is, is a buildup of plaque or protein um, in the brain, and that can be associated with Alzheimer's dementia, so it tends to happen in elderly individuals, usually people in their 70s or later, and they may not have high blood pressure, but they've accumulated over time this sort of abnormal deposition of plaque um, that can make things more fragile, it distorts the natural um, kind of substance of the brain and, and you can ooze or bleed into that. Um, vascular abnormalities, and this could be a lot of things, but the most common is probably a brain aneurysm. Um, you may have heard of that, where if you think of a water balloon, when they're small, they're unlikely to pop, but as the aneurysm gets bigger, like a water balloon expanding, that pressure is gonna build up and they can actually rupture and cause bleeding either over the surface of the brain or into the brain tissue itself. And then finally, coagulopathy, and the medical, that's just a medical term that means your blood is thinned out for some reason. It's not um, working the way that it should. And it can, that can either be from medications that you're taking or sometimes there are genetic um, conditions that make you more prone to clotting too. So as you can see, there's a lot of different things that can cause a stroke. Um, and a lot of when, I, when we get people in the hospital, the first thing is determining that they're having a stroke and trying to do the acute treatments. And then a lot of what we spend after, after the dust is settled is trying to kind of hunt around and figure out the cause of this. Why did it happen? Because that helps us tailor our medical treatment to try to prevent another stroke from happening. So real quick, before I go on to stroke risk factors, <clears throat> we mentioned the signs and symptoms of stroke here. We've got our, our nice little acronym FAST for recognizing those signs and symptoms and getting into the hospital. 
treatment for stroke has really um, advanced rapidly in the last five years to the point that when I was a medical student, there were patients that would come in that frankly, there was just not enough that we could do for them. They woke up with their symptoms and they, the last time anyone saw them normal was last night before they went to bed. Uh, we gave them the clot busting drug and it didn't do enough to open it up. And now we're in a, a situation where we are much better equipped to try to help people. And our big options for treatment are um, something called IVTPA, which is this potent clot busting drug. It's a shot that we can give. Uh, and then it runs as an IV infusion for an hour. And that can break apart um, a clot for an ischemic stroke and help get that blood flow back up to the brain. Um, and then also with clots, if, if we can go in now with a surgical procedure, doing a groin puncture and actually threading a catheter up into the brain and actually being able to pull that clot out uh, manually and open that um, blood flow back up and hopefully get the blood flow going back to the um, area of brain that's at risk before it's permanently damaged. Um, and the time windows and our ability to do that and the kind of images or pictures that we can take to figure out, can we save the brain, can we not? Um, have really advanced a lot um, over, the, over the last five to 10 years. So it's an exciting time to be a stroke doctor. Um, it's wonderful to um, have those folks that you're able to help before there's permanent damage done or to minimize it so that they've got a better chance at recovery. Um, but everything is kind of contingent on recognizing that a stroke is happening and getting into the hospital so that we can help people. So go, moving along here, like I said earlier, way better than treating a stroke is not to have one uh, in the first place. So the majority of what I wanna talk about uh, this evening is the stroke risk factors and what you can do to try to prevent uh, yourself from having a stroke or at least drastically reduce the chance of that. And I've got here kind of two columns and these are, these are how I would sort of mentally divide out or think about stroke risk. So on the left side here are things that we can't change. You know, this is the hand that we were dealt and some of these things can increase our risk of stroke or, or things about it are more prone to having stroke. So things like our age, um, our background, ethnic background, a prior history of stroke, maybe you've already had a stroke um, that can put you at risk for having another. And then our family history, our genes, kind of this is what we were born with. Um, and then on the right-hand side are the things that we can change or these modifiable risk factors. And you'll notice that these are similar to the risk factors for some other medical conditions like heart attacks, uh, for example. And they include things like hypertension or high blood pressure, high cholesterol, diabetes, um, a lack of exercise, so being sedentary, uh, smoking, tobacco use, heavy drinking, and then illicit drug use as well. So we'll kind of go through some of these and talk about um, how much we can reduce our risk of stroke and the things that we can do to try to get these risk factors uh, under control. So first of all, the things that we call non-modifiable risk factors are what we can't change. So age by far and away is probably the biggest risk factor for stroke, right? And I think all of us know somebody or see this, right? There's very unusual for young people, people that are uh, kids or people in their 20s, it can happen. And, and it's, those rates have actually been climbing in, um, in recent years. But in general, most people who have strokes tend to happen um, later in life. And the risk of stroke actually doubles uh, each decade after age 55. So you can imagine someone who is in their 80s is at a much higher risk of stroke than someone who's 50 or 60. Uh, race and ethnicity. So um, African-American population, Hispanic and Asians have two times the risk of stroke as Caucasians. Now, when I was in medical school and they were teaching me about this, I thought, okay, there must, is there something genetically? And that's kind of how it was um, thought of at the time. And that's really, I think over time, they're realizing that this is really more of an indicator of what we call social determinants of health or, or socioeconomic factors. So a lot of this um, plays into what you grew up with, the environment that you were in, and when we think about access to care or food deserts, we'll talk about nutrition a little bit. It's hard to eat well if you're in a community or in an environment where there's maybe not a grocery store or not a farmer's market or not access to good food. Um, stress, right? With stress can be a huge um, factor for stroke. And if you're in a community that is struggling with either poverty or violence or other things, all of that can take a toll on the body. So I think a lot of what this is getting at is um, factors that are specific to different communities. Genetics or heredity, sometimes there are certain mutations that, like I mentioned before, can make you prone to clotting. 
but also just having a family member that has a history of stroke. And we say first degree, that usually means your parents, your siblings, um, hopefully not your child, but somebody that's directly related to you, if they have a history of stroke, um, that means there may be a propensity or may put you at higher risk of having one as well. And then the other thing is a prior transient ischemic attack. Now, I didn't talk about this earlier, but it's sort of along the same continuum as an ischemic stroke, but essentially your body breaks the clot up and gets the blood flow back pretty quickly, usually within a few minutes um, before any permanent damage can happen. But what I tell my patients that come in to see me who've had a TIA is, look, your body fired a warning shot and you got better this time and it went away. Um, but that tells us that you may have a setup here that could put you at risk for having a stroke in the future. Um, and so we take those TIA events very seriously and actually treat them as if you did have a stroke. We do all the testing and we do a lot of the, the workup and looking at the risk factors um, because we don't want uh, a week or a day or a week later, you know, or months later um, to go on to actually have a stroke with permanent damage. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the um, modifiable risk factors. So the first one I have here is um, hypertension or what is a normal blood pressure? And we've got a small group here, so I won't pick on anybody, but if anyone knows and wants to take a guess, um, it's tricky because they, they change the numbers on us a little bit here or there, but ideally 130 over 90, less than 140 over 80, 120 over 80, or 150 over 80. I don't know if anyone wants to take a guess at what um, the- I'll the take- I'll take A. You're going to take A, 130 over 90. All right. I Any think it's other? C. C, 120 over 80. I say C, 120 C. over 80. Add another C. Okay. All right. So yeah, the, the C folks actually uh, have it and uh, they've changed that over the years. And so um, for a long time, they used to say, okay, under one, 140 over 90. If you're under that, you're okay. But what they were realizing is, you know, sitting in the high 130s, 138 over, you know, 89, things like that, actually over time can take um, some toll too. So um, there was a, a medical trial, something called the SPRINT trial, where they actually looked at um, driving that a little bit lower and getting it really below 120 over 80. And um, they found that that really did have a positive uh, effect on preventing heart attacks and strokes. Now, albeit some, there were a few people in the study that got woozy or lightheaded when it was that low, um, or they weren't, you know, peeing enough and their kidneys got affected. So it's not, you know, for everyone, you have to kind of monitor the individual, but if you can tolerate it, keeping the blood pressure down in the one teens below 120 over 80 um, may have a benefit. And when we talked earlier about non-modifiable, the stuff you can't change, as of right now, we can't change the fact that we're all getting older, can't do anything about it. But for the modifiable risk factors, the biggest bang for your buck for preventing a stroke is going to be hypertension. So if you could, if I as a stroke doc could pick one thing um, that that people could do to prevent a stroke, I'd say they know what your blood pressure is, know what those numbers are doing, and get it under control if it's too high, because that's going to be the biggest thing. So it can reduce your risk of stroke by almost forty percent, which is huge. And even that, like a relatively modest reduction, let's say that top number, the systolic blood pressure cutting that by 10 millimeters of mercury or 20 millimeters, you can really see an actual percentage decrease in your likelihood of having a stroke. So making these changes um, is really going to be um, a huge part of stroke prevention. Um, so the other things in addition, we think of medications and obviously it's hugely important, um, but bear in mind that it's not just, there are people that just genetically are prone to hypertension and they've got to be on meds and sometimes multiple medications and, you know, ratcheting up the doses until they can get this number where it needs to be. Um, and so oftentimes it takes a bit of work to get into that, that sweet spot and into a good range. Um, so it's important to have a good, um, doctor that you trust that you can go in and it may take a few visits over weeks to kind of titrate that down and get it in to a good level, but it's worth doing that with the medicines, but then also realizing that um, blood pressure can be affected by your lifestyle choices too. So um, weight loss, and we'll talk about that later, but I think um, one of the important things to stress with weight loss, we think of this ideal number, like we're going to get to our perfect ideal body weight, and that is hard. But I tell my patients that if you can lose five or 10 pounds, that may have a beneficial effect on your blood pressure. And so it's worth doing that and making that effort, even if you don't get down to the ideal you know, size clothes that you want to be or that number on the scale, even modest improvements can help that profile and help your blood pressure numbers improve. Um, salt restriction, <coughs> excuse me, we'll talk about that a little bit later, but um, 
that can be a big driver. Um, so a lot of dietary salt intake can um, elevate your blood pressure. And then finally exercise. So actually getting that heart rate up and exercising, then when you rest, the blood pressure comes back down and your resting blood pressure goes to a lower level. So it's really important to include physical activity as part of your treatment for hypertension. Um, taking your medicines regularly, getting a home blood pressure monitor and a journal to keep track of it, I think is really important. So again, coming into your doctor once a year or maybe um, every couple months, that may not be enough if you actually have high blood pressure. If you, if you have it and you, you need to really have that home cuff and check it periodically and kind of know what it's doing, you may settle into a, a rhythm where you know what your blood pressure is doing and how your medicines are doing, but you want to really make sure um, that you know what it is in the morning, what is at night, and you kind of know those numbers, you're comfortable with them, you're comfortable checking your own blood pressure as well. Um, okay, so let's move on to cholesterol, which is enough. So we talked about hypertension being a big risk factor for um, stroke, and now we're going to move on to cholesterol here, or hyperlipidemia. So what is the bad type of cholesterol? And we've got a breakdown here. So total cholesterol, HDL, which stands for high-density lipoprotein, triglycerides, or low-density lipoprotein. So which of those do you think is sort of the, the bad cholesterol, especially when we're talking about strokes? I think it's B. I'm not sure. B, okay. Any other takers? Um, C. Heard someone say C. Any others? Okay. We'll get to the answer in a second here. So the so hyperlipidemia or high cholesterol comes from two places, right? What we eat, which is what's coming in through our mouth and what our body makes. Our, our liver actually makes cholesterol. It's a genetic thing. So um, it's important to watch the diet and to make sure that we're eating foods that are low in saturated fats, which tend to have a lot of cholesterol in them. Um, but for some people, diet is not enough. Uh, you may actually need a medicine to help lower your cholesterol. And that may be because you have a genetic propensity to have these higher cholesterol levels. Um, one out of four Americans have high cholesterol, so it's common, a lot of people do. Um, and then being aware that these medicines that we have that really I think are, are addressing the, the side of it about what you make, endogenous production or what you're genetically prone to, um, the statin medications are extremely effective at that and they can cut your risk of stroke by up to 30%, right? So it's almost a third that you can cut that down. Um, statins lower the LDL. So that LDL is the bad cholesterol. So low density lipoprotein. So I kind of think of that as like dryer lint. It's sort of going around clogging things up. The HDL, which was the B, answer B, um, is the high density lipoprotein. And you may hear people talk about quote unquote good cholesterol. And I think of that like a bowling ball kind of going through your arteries and it, it may actually help kind of clean them out. Um, and so you want the HDL to be boosted up and you want the LDL to be lowered down. Uh, and then the statin medications actually do both those things concurrently. So they boost up the good cholesterol and they lower the LDL. Obviously, I tell all my patients, the statins are great. They're not a substitute for a good diet and healthy lifestyle changes. So you do those two together and it's like a one-two punch and you actually um, have the biggest benefit. So obesity, we mentioned before, now those go along with some of these other risk factors. So six out of 10 Americans are currently overweight or obese. And by 2030, it's predicted that up to 86% of Americans will be. So it's a big problem. Um, and it's not just whether you're obese, it's kind of where that fat is, is settling. So people who are a little bit um, heavier in the thighs and hips are actually in a better boat than the people of that more apple shape where you've got a lot of the central obesity around the Hello. waist and more I'm belly fat. Monica Easley McCraney. And I am the uh, 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 of well, <laughs> So the waist circumference is part of this too. So the goal is like 35 inches. And when you get above that, every inch adds about a 2% risk for stroke. Um, so really focusing on weight loss, exercise, and a dot, balanced diet are all hugely important for um, stroke prevention. So things that we can do to kind of aim for a healthy diet. The first one's a really big one, limiting takeout or, or dining out. Now, any kind of restaurant food, takeout food, fast food is gonna have a lot more salt in it than what you're gonna cook at home. So ideally shopping, buying your own food, cooking your own food at home is gonna be a lot healthier than, than what you get at a restaurant. They really load it up with salt, oftentimes a lot of fat as well because it tastes good. And so then you think that's a great restaurant, I'm gonna go back. Um, but the nutritional information, you know, is not there and it's not as healthy for you. So once in a while is fine, but um, really trying to avoid that being a daily habit. 
trying to choose fruits and veggies, grains, ideally whole grains like brown bread, brown rice, uh, and then getting some of your protein that are not from animal products. So getting nuts, things like walnuts and um, you know almonds and all of those kind of things give you um, beans are actually really good too. They have a lot of protein in them. Um, so getting some other sources of protein in your diet. When you talk about what you're cooking with and what you're putting on bread and things like that, olive oil, oil because it's an unsaturated fat is better than using the saturated fats like the butter and particularly the margarine, which has a lot of um, trans fat and sort of artificial um, elements to it. Ideally sticking with more of the olive oil or canola oil is a better way to go. And then really minimizing um, salt intake, fried foods, fatty foods, and uh, limitation of alcohol as well. So in my Moderation, we'll talk a little bit about alcohol later, is okay, um, but we don't want to have heavy drinking. It's empty calories, number one, and then it can also just be hard on the body in a, in a variety of ways. So is it heart healthy, right? So again, the saturated fats on, this, on the right side, I have the sort of refined processed foods, starches, white bread, candy, rice, a lot of this really sugary stuff that you're going to feel full for about 15 <laughs> minutes to a half hour. And then as your blood sugar starts to plummet, it actually triggers that sensation of hunger again. Even though you took in a ton of calories, your brain feels the sugar rush, thinks it's full. And when it feel, whenever your brain feels the sugar levels dropping, it thinks you're starving. So then you feel hungry again, even though you actually had enough calories. So that's why the processed stuff is really um, something you want to avoid. Um, the saturated fats, again, in moderation, you know, if you like to have a nice steak dinner once in a while, that's okay, but it shouldn't be every single day of the week you're having some kind of a hamburger or a steak or all the red meat. Um, we talked about whole grains. Again, I think that's one of the big things that's got the fiber in it. So it makes you feel full longer. And it also has more vitamins in it as well. So you're getting uh, better nutrients with the brown bread and the brown rice. And it's actually helping you um, stay full longer. It helps your digestive system with the fiber. Um, and it can actually help with the cholesterol levels too. Some of the um, fiber in, in um, whole grains can actually help kind of clear out some of the cholesterol from your body as well. Um, so here's my quiz that I'll that kind of talk to patients in my clinic about, you know, is this healthy? So this is my sort of rule of thumb. There's some exceptions to this, but for the most part, if you can stick this in your kitchen and, and put it in your cabinet and the box is open and you come back a month later and you pop open that box or you open the wrapper and you eat it and it's fine. The reason that it hasn't rotted is that it's full of saturated fats. It's full of preservatives. It's full of a lot of salt. Right, so the things on the left side here, I have like a Twinkie as an example, candy bars, chips, canned foods or salty foods, right? All of that stuff, you could probably come back a year later and it wouldn't taste a whole lot different than it does today. On the right side here, I have some examples, fish, lettuce, apples, yogurt, right? You don't want that out on your shelf for a long amount of time because it's, it's whole food, it's fresh, there's limited amount of preservatives in it and it's gonna go bad if you don't eat it soon. So you really wanna lean towards um, a lot of the stuff that in the supermarket is going to be in those refrigerated uh, areas, usually ringing the outside of the supermarket and then those central aisles where the shelves are, are a lot of heavily processed and preserved foods. Right, so again, this is all of the salt, the sugar, you're noticing the recurring theme. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about exercise. So a sedentary lifestyle is, is a big risk factor for stroke as well. Um, and getting physical activity is really important for a number of things, cutting stroke risk, but there's also pretty good evidence that it can help your mood. It can cut your risk of a lot of other medical problems as well. So, um, you know, I don't think of this as just like writing a prescription or pills. This, if I could write a prescription and guarantee that somebody was going to get up and get, uh, say, 30 minutes of cardiovascular exercise every day, you know, I wish I could do that because they're going to really um, see a benefit from that. You don't have to be a marathon runner to be healthy. I think some people, especially if you're not somebody who works out, it can be a little bit intimidating to think about, you know, going to this gym where everybody's um, super fit and there are all these athletes. You don't have to be like that. Anything you do, even walking, um, walking is a really great exercise, is going to give you some benefit for your health. So find something that you like doing. Don't force yourself to go do some sort of exercise or some sport that you're not into. Maybe it's walking with a friend and then you can chat and catch up on the day. Um, maybe you like to, maybe you have balance. Some of my patients have balance issues and they're worried about um, falling if they're on a bike or something like that. So they'll go in a pool and do water walking um, or maybe swimming because they have that buoyancy to them. Um, but you know, something that you enjoy um, so that you actually want to do it. And then if it's somebody that has not worked out a lot before, starting slow, listening to your body, sort of gradually building up is really important. 
Okay, so maintaining a healthy weight, we talk about a normal body index or BMI. Um, does anybody know the kind of goal here for BMI? Less than 24, 25, 26, or less than 30? B? I'm gonna stick with A. Okay, you guys are both, they're one point off there, but yeah, so tw under 25 is considered normal. And then okay. 25 to 30 is then that sort of overweight range. And then anything above 30 um, is considered um, over. Now, the caveat for this is it's not a great metric. And you may have seen, you know, in, the, in newspaper and articles about it, that it's not perfect. I mean, the idea is they want to kind of account for how tall you are to how heavy you weigh. And, um, you know, so it may be a little bit better than just using a straight number on the scale. But you'll notice like a lot of NFL football players have this BMI that's crazy, like 35 or something, but they're all, they're super big and muscular. So for people who are really muscular, but actually fit, um, BMI may not be the best metric. So bear that in mind, but roughly for most of us, this gives us a kind of a good sense um, ballpark of where we are. So they use the height and the weight. Um, and then the, the issue and what we've been able to correlate with stroke is that for every point above um, that 25 mark, um, you're going to have your see your stroke risk creep up a little bit with the BMI. So these are some facts that I really like to point out to my patients. Um, again, because I think a lot of people think about exercise mostly in the context of wanting to lose weight um, or look good or sort of get to a goal weight. And the health benefits of exercise, um, you're going to see those whether or not the scale moves at all. So even if you don't lose weight, you are still decreasing your risk of stroke and heart disease. And so I think a lot of people start working out and then they don't see the scale go down and they get frustrated and they think, well, what am I doing? I've been you know, going out and walking for an hour every night after dinner and it looks the same and I've been lifting weights and you know, nothing has changed. Um, and oftentimes as you start to build up muscle, muscle weighs more than fat. And so you may stay at a similar weight even though your actual sort of body composition is in a healthier state. And even if nothing changes, just that physical activity itself um, actually gives you some protection against stroke and heart attack. Another thing that I think is interesting is that people who have a workout buddy tend to get more exercise. And I think this makes sense because it's a little bit of peer, good peer pressure um, and some accountability as well. So if you've got a friend that, you know, you just have a standing date, like every day at lunch, you guys are going to go out and you're going to walk for 30 minutes before you go back to your desk. You've got that kind of built in so that they're, they're there, they're waiting for you. It's uh, much more likely that you're going to be consistent in getting exercise. Um, the other one is that people who listen to music tend to exercise longer and more intensely. I think that's certainly true for me. I think the idea of going running without music would be <laughs> really difficult for me. So something that's got a good beat to it um, and can motivate you can really be helpful um, as well.